Well, hello everyone. I would like to welcome Brian Bowman today with Ecom Underground. Let me tell you all just a little bit about Brian. He is an entrepreneur from Chicago and now he is in North Carolina. So I'm sure he's going to start picking up an awesome accent very, <laughs> very shortly. I can still, yeah. I can still hear the Northern accent, but let's, let's give him a few more months. So <laughs> we'll have to hear more about your move and if there's any culture shock going to uh, North Carolina. But that said, I love that state, one of my favorite places. Brian left his corporate career to pave his own way and went on to build a highly successful e-commerce company. Brian is a digital marketing consultant who personally helps e-commerce sellers build e-commerce brands that don't depend on specific marketplaces for their survival, such as Amazon, eBay, Brian's clients range from small startups to multi-million dollar brands, and he's helped them all leverage digital marketing to dominate their markets online. So I would like to welcome Brian, and thank you so much for taking the time out of, I'm sure your very busy day, golfing and doing jujitsu <laughs> and meditating. So thank you so much for being here. Is there anything about Brian that you want to tell me um, that maybe I didn't hit on in your professional bio? Um, so I don't know. I, uh, so first of all, Susie, thanks for uh, having me on. I'm excited to uh, be here and chat with you. Um, I know we've, we've had a, a few conversations sort of behind the scenes, so it's really cool that we get to sort of uh, talk about different stuff and uh, hopefully, hopefully share some, some good stuff for, for your listeners and uh, some things that they can actually put into, into practice in their, in their business and their brands. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm, uh, you know, those bios are always a little weird, right? Cause they, they're very like, oh, da, 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 da. they're very like professional. Like, honestly, I'm just, I try to, I don't know. I guess the biggest thing is I try to be a little more curious than afraid in my life and, and try to try to try new things. And even in business, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to, I, I see business and life as like an iterative process. Right. So mm -hmm. It's like life's not a project. And even business isn't a project. I see a lot of people that want to make business a project. They want to have, and I think it's, it's good to have a plan and goals and stuff. But, you know, when I read about people having like one year plans, it's like, you know, the time when you can make the best decision is when you have the most information, right? Mm -hmm. Yet people are making decisions about what they're going to do like two years from now. And it's good to have a plan. But I just think probably the one thing that I should add to that is just, yeah, you know, I like to, I like to try things. I like to, um, like in my life, I've played professional golf. I've been, I've been a, I've done jujitsu at like the national level. <laughs> like I just always like to try things and just keep life, you know, exciting. I think um, you made, you, you kind of said something there that was just the epitome of an entrepreneur. You don't, you don't live your life being afraid. You live your life curious. And that is, that is really, I think, the epitome of what entrepreneurialism is. And you have to really have that within you Absolutely. to be an entrepreneur. Absolutely. There's this, there's this like picture that's being painted of like an entrepreneur, like it's glamorous and entrepreneur is like this upgrade, right? Well, being an entrepreneur isn't for everyone. I know it's, yeah. people have said that, but it really isn't. It's not, it's almost like, you know, kind of in the, in the e-commerce space, I've noticed a trend that people who are doing uh, wholesale or online arbitrage, let's say, that the upgrade is private label. Like private label may not be the best thing for you. It's a whole different beast. It is a whole And different. some people don't have the, um, it reminds me of Warren Buffett when he said, when he's asked, what's the number one quality or what's the number one thing that a great investor has to have? And you'd think it's like math skills or ability to you know, make relationships or whatever it is. He said, the right temperament. Mm. <laughs> like that's what it takes to be a great investor. Yeah. And I think you could say the same thing about entrepreneurship. It takes the right temperament and the right um, ability to take on risk, the right, of, the right combination of being okay with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be a great intrapreneur in a company and still have autonomy and still have significance and still have, be able to work on mastery and be, be great at something, but not have that, that additional, uh, you know, element of, uncertainty that's that's present with not being an entrepreneur so yeah i love that some people just cannot live with uncertainty and that could just be the way that they 
I don't like it up. either. <laughs> like, I don't like it either. I thought, I'm not saying like, oh, I love not knowing what's going to happen this it's month. It's kind of fun though. Come on now. Yeah, you know a little bit. But the, <laughs> trust me, there's times where <laughs> like, man, it would be nice to just know, to just know what's going to happen. But I get, I'll tell you, I've gone down that road and man, I just, I couldn't do it. I was a, I was a consulting actuary for years and I traveled, I traveled like over a hundred thousand miles a year real nice bonus, real nice check, all that stuff. Like on the outside, it looked like, wow, you're, you're doing it. Like you made it. Living the dream it. and I you're miserable. It. Like yeah. literally yeah. every day. And I'm, you probably can relate <laughs> to that as, you know, I, there's a lot of people who go to law school, right? They're going to be attorneys. And once they get into it, they're like, yeah, what, what is this? You're like, why am I here? I yeah. don't want the corner office. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It doesn't. Give me, Give me a, give me a crappy home office where I can wear my pajamas. Like I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you are the founder of Ecom Underground. So I would love to, first of all, know sort of your rationale for how you came up with that name. And obviously because I'm a trademark attorney and I love, I love name creation stories. I love it when people can tell me, oh, okay, well, you know, we were sitting around a table or, or whatever it is. I love that. Yeah, there's actually yeah. a really, there's actually a story behind this. So tell me, let's talk about it. So um, this all started, it all started because I was documenting my journey as a private label seller. And because I had a, like a, a strong, I was a math major. I was an actuary. I don't know if you know what an actuary is. If you're anyone listening knows what it is. Um, they're anyway, <laughs> Basically, we, we like these numbers. Asleep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we like this is this is where every this is where your bounce rate goes up. Like, it's like yeah, new things. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I I um I was good at like PPC and I was good at like the stats behind you know the the numbers behind business, um behind running a private label business on Amazon. So I started documenting the process and it was called AMZ something like go figure right AMZ something I think it was Profit hmm. Pros or something like that. Wonder what that was for. <laughs> yeah, and then so I was at a mastermind event. So I, I'm I've been a part of several masterminds over the last few years, and uh, I was brainstorming, and I had this bigger vision of what I wanted to do. I wanted it to be way more than just Amazon, um, because we had felt the pressure of getting our listings shut down and all that stuff. And I was I had to start marketing off Amazon and building a brand off Amazon. So I started documenting that process, and. I wanted to talk more about e-commerce in general. And the thing that actually gets me excited is the numbers behind business. And, and if you can get the numbers right, you can scale your business. And it's so and much more that's fun. That's so key because so many people don't like that part. Yeah. You know? And it's and it's basic math. Like we're not talking about crazy, you know, we're not, it's not, we're not doing differential equations or anything. It's like, uh, there's a great quote by Gary Halbert, the great copywriter, um, yeah. that we're all in the same business. We're in the arithmetic business. That's it. Doesn't matter what you sell, we're all in the arithmetic business. So if you know your numbers, it's a huge competitive advantage. So anyway, so I was in this mastermind event. You know, it's one of these events where a bunch of entrepreneurs, like I'm like, I'm, I'm easily the least successful person in this room, right? Just brilliant, brilliant minds and they're brilliant business people. Been there. And um, they, I'm like, I want, a, I want a new name and I want it to be like, I want it to be like a tribe and we're all in this together and I'm just giving them like, I'm coaching, I'm consulting, I'm giving them guidance, I'm supporting them, they're supporting each other and we're like our own group. And then my good friend, Juju Hook, she's a branding expert. She literally is like, she used to do branding for like Fortune 100 companies, like 30 years as a branding expert, she's amazing. So she was the one who said, what about underground e-com? That's what she originally said. I was like, underground e-com, what about e-com underground? And we, I flipped it, Yeah. she's like, oh, I love it. And that was it, like from that day, I just went with it because I like the idea of it being like underground and, you know, it's like our own crew, like yeah. we support each other, kind of like our own little gang, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I don't know. I think if you talk to people who are in it, uh, especially in our intensive program, you know, it's, it's probably one of the most engaged, you know, we got 78 brand owners in there and it's oh, wow. probably one of the most engaged communities you'll find with just 78 people. Oh, I'm um, sure. Yeah. So. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for your creation story. <laughs> yeah. So um, one thing I like, I like that you're not AMZ underground and that you're yeah, yeah. e-com underground. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, selling on Amazon versus selling off of Amazon. I'm a big believer and I harp on this a lot. Create a, you know, create a brand. 
create yeah. a business that can exist whether or not Amazon does or not. And Amazon and other marketplaces are sort of like the landlords, right? And you have very little autonomy at the end of the day when it comes to selling on those marketplaces. So let's talk about that. 100%. And, and this is one thing that if you're listening to this, um, if this applies to you at all, if there's something that's been on your mind, like I want to I want to give you as much clarity on this as possible because I've done this so many times now where I've helped brands transition through this process. And here's the biggest thing I've seen. If you can just focus on this, you'll be in a really good position. So on Amazon or on marketplaces, Walmart, Amazon, Google, I mean, Google's new marketplace is amazing. We can, I don't know, we don't talk about that, but just put, put a bookmark that if you're listening it's to there. this to check it out. <laughs> um, so whatever marketplace you're on eBay, uh, it's, it's very product centric. It's very product focused. And yes, you have to write great listings. Yes, you have to write, you know, I remember, I remember the, the wild west days, you know, 2013 and, and before 2014 and before you could put up any listing, a photo from your you know, phone and a few bullet points and it would sell, you know, now you do have to write good listings and we have EBC and we've got, you know, you do have to, talk about the, the consumer and the buyer persona. But at the end of the day, let's face it, it is product centric. Mm -hmm. It's reviews, it's price, and it's a search term. Like those are the things that are really driving you know, a lot of the action, right? So ultimately you gotta rank it and people are going there for a specific product. When you transition to outside Amazon, so on Amazon or on any marketplace, it's product over person. That's just, that's just how it is. When we go off the marketplaces, it's very much person before product. Interesting. So in our program, our program is called Ecom Intensive and it's a six month program to help establish brand owners. So it's not, it's not a business opportunity. It's not for people who are thinking about starting e-commerce. If you are in a marketplace and you are, you know, you're, you're crushing it, you're doing really well with your thingamabob that you're selling and you want to create um, like a tribe around this, or you want to create a real brand around this and a real audience. That's what we do. We help you transition. We don't start running ads until like week five of the program. Week one is all about buyer persona. And it's always the hardest thing for it Amazon is. sellers when they hop in, they're like, this is crazy. I, I can't do this. And we give them worksheets and step-by-step -step and everything. We guide them through it. But I can, I can tell you, you know, I can predict if you come in the program, the number one thing that will be a, the, the road bump will be the buyer persona. But once you establish that and you become an insider and you truly understand like who's buying this thing, like this Leatherman, sidekick on Amazon, I got a rank for Leatherman. I got a rank for sidekick. I got a rank for multi-use tool, right? Mm -hmm. On off Amazon, I know they're going to want this, but I got to really understand who's the guy or the gal who's going to want this. What are they using it for? What other things have they tried that have failed? What, you know, what's going to happen when they use it, right? What are they going to feel like? Like I need to focus on that because then that's going to help me find them in like a, in a lot of noise out there it's going to help me attract them and then put the product in front of them. Mm -hmm. So if you take this, the mentality of product first and apply it off Amazon, what ends up happening? You throw up a site, you put some product photos, you put maybe some ones of people smiling like, Oh, these are great product photos. And then you start launching ads right away and nothing happens. Crickets, right? The click through rates low. And if they do show up on the site, they don't buy mm -hmm. because you're trying to do product first. And there's just too much noise out there. Too many people are doing that. So um, it really is person first off Amazon or off the marketplaces. And here's the other thing. And I just want to point this out and I'll, I'll stop uh, because this is something it's, it, I've seen so many times. And when you do it right, you give yourself a, an amazing chance of success. And you can have the best of both worlds. That's the thing. You can have the 800 pound gorilla that's just driving sales for you profitably. And you can also build a brand that gives you stability. Mm -hmm. So that way you're getting the best of both. And if anything happens on this side, you've got this to fall back on and you've got, you know, thousands of customers that you can follow up with and move inventory and still build your business and still sell without that. And this thing stops no good. Right. Um, is realistically, you know, if you sell these, you know, Leatherman's a huge company, right? It's a huge brand. Realistically, you're probably not going to build the next Coca-Cola. Like, and I know you're not, you, you know, in, in the success mind circles and positive thinking, you're not supposed to say that, but let's be real. You're probably not going to build the next 
Expo dry erase marker company. <laughs> or but the here's the beauty. <laughs> What's that? Or the post-it. Or the post-it. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. But here's the beauty of this. You don't have to. You really right. do not have to. To build and create a really good life and to have a really good exit in your company, you just got to make sure the numbers are right. And this is the number one thing is that you build a loyal following. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned in jujitsu was you don't beat big by going big. So jujitsu is all about leverage. I'm not a very big guy. Um, and jujitsu, the reason I loved it was because I'm not a big guy. So it, it made me able to like defend myself and allowed me to do things to much bigger opponents that I never would have been able to do. Like if I just tried to like out strength, like outpower a 250 pound guy, like I'm going to get destroyed. Right. And that's the same thing with business. It's like, if we try to be Coca-Cola, if we try to be, you know, Hydro Flask, um, we're going to lose because they have, a, they have a huge budget. They have huge resources we don't have. But in jujitsu, I know that as a smaller guy, there's things I can do that the bigger guy can't. I'm more nimble. I can, I, there's certain techniques that are available to me that aren't available to the bigger guy. And if I know my strengths, I can actually beat a bigger opponent, which makes no sense. So the fact that you are small, it's okay. You can, you can really, you can, you can talk to each one of these customers, you know, do things that don't scale. That was a very famous quote from one of the founders of, of Y Combinator, I think. And he said, when you're growing a business, do things that don't scale. People are like, oh, it won't scale to call every customer up individually and thank them. You're right. But guess who won't do that? Coca-Cola ain't going to do that. Mm -hmm. Hydroflask isn't going to do that. Expo company isn't going to do that, but you can. And all you need is a loyal following. And that's when you can have a snowball effect. And like, again, you maybe will never be a $10 million company. You don't have to be. So anyway, that's my, that's my spiel. Cause I, it's so important. Yeah. I um, was listening to one of your podcasts and you made a really good point about how, if you don't have a list, you don't have a business, right? And there's yes. something along those lines. And yep. Amazon and the other marketplaces are not conducive to sellers being able to build their own list. And you're gonna have to do that, that particular asset off, off those platforms. And one way to do that, of course, and you've mentioned this, is that buyer persona. I call it, I've called it an ideal uh, or idea customer avatar yep. and I've had to do it for my own business and it's something everyone kind of struggles with I feel like so and you mentioned in your in your intensive that you kind of walk people through the, the creation of their buyer persona will you maybe give us like a couple little a little thing a couple little things to keep in mind without giving everything away yeah, for <laughs> about sure, for sure. this is so important yeah, and it's so and obviously important. You know, and obviously here, I'm actually going to pull up, uh, I'm actually, I actually want to pull up everything that we go through in that first, in that first section of the program. Cause I want to give you, I actually want to give you a really good, and then the, and the listener, I want to, I want to give you some really good insight that you can r at least start with. And that would be I awesome. mean, obviously, you know, obviously if, if you think, you know, it's something that would be a good fit, you know, we could talk about that, but I, I think you can do a lot of this work on your own, um, at least to get started. So the first thing we do is. Um, and I just want to pull this up. So there's a few things that we do and, and here's, it all starts with, um, understanding the, the buyer and becoming an insider. So before you actually create the persona, so the persona is an actual persona. It's, it's John Williams and you look up a photo and like, you just pick a photo that seems like it's John Williams <laughs> who would buy this. And like, we actually print it out and put it on the wall. So this is John. John is a dad. He's duh. He has two kids. He works a nine to five. He's, you know, whatever it is, like we actually write out a persona, but that's the end product. Before we do that, there's a lot of research that happens. So the first thing we do is we go through 10 questions that are allowing us to sort of peer into the, the mind of John. So what are, what are his, what are the pain points? What are the aspirations? A big thing to consider is, what are the, their decision-making biases? So for example, um, you know, artists, people who are more artistic are going to be more, and the, I'm making generalizations. So I know someone's going to be like, not me, I'm an artist and I'm very logical with all my decisions. <laughs> well, I know. Okay, fine. You know, I'm, I can say for me, I'm a, 
I'm a, I was a math major, like I was an actuary. I know I'm very analytical. So I make decisions very analytically. I'm more of like an engineer when I make decisions, right? I'm the guy who's going to make a pros and cons sort of list in my head. I'm the, one, I'm the guy who's going to evaluate the expected value of the payoff. What's the downside? What's the upside? If the upside's higher, I'm going to go with it. Like that's just how my brain thinks. I can tell you my wife is definitely going to be more emotional, right? Any realtor knows you got to make sure the kitchen is redone. Like that's huge. It's every realtor knows like that's such an emotional piece of the decision. People will justify, some people justify the house with, oh, it's a great school district. The taxes are low, but it's like the kitchen and the landscaping or whatever, right? That really get <laughs> them excited. Point. <laughs> so it's, what's that? They have to be on point. <laughs> yeah. So the point is like, understand your buyer. Are they more, what are their biases? What kind of language do they use? Um, what are they angry about? Uh, are they, you know, people are either running away from something they, they fear or they're running towards something they desire. What are those things? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, what, what have they tried before and like, has it failed and why did it fail? So like really getting into the psychographics of the buyer, that's like step one before you can build a persona. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing you want to do is um, do a full demographic like research. And this is where audience insights, if you have Google analytics on your site, now probably, you probably don't because especially if you don't have a site yet, right? You have no research to start with. So, or no data to start with, um, or any data to start with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you want to, uh, you can use audience insights on Facebook to get ideas on demographics, age ranges, location, things like that, other interests, and one thing to keep in mind is when you go through this process of building a buyer persona, it is an iterative process. Version one is going to be horrible. It's going to suck. Version two will suck. Version three will suck a little less. Like version four is actually starting to get kind of decent. Um, so don't, don't get hung up on like, oh, but is this right? Uh, another tip, this is a huge tip, which I did when, when our first brand was in the camping, you know, camping, outdoor space, hiking, stuff like that. Um, and we sold a lot of stuff that you would find in like REI. So I would go into an REI and I would stand next to the camping hammocks. And when someone would look at them, I would pretend I was looking at them. And then they would, you know, be, they would put one back. I'd be like, oh, I know, like, you know, what, like, what are you gonna use this for? And I would actually ask questions, um, you know, and like, I don't know which color, like, do you like, I think I like this one better. What do you think? So like, that's my buyer right there. Like they're yeah, shopping. That's um, so smart. And you get a lot of insight and you know, I, I'm, I'm, I have no problem starting a random conversation with people. It's actually a lot of fun. So go try that. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Like kind of think about who your competitor is and really get out there and do that research. If you have to go like set up an REI, you know, maybe hang out on one of their hammocks or. <laughs> I used to spend like two hours hanging out in REI, like just walking around the aisles. Yeah. Like yeah. waiting. And if someone would, you know, I kind of initiate a conversation and be like, oh, hey, weirdo. Like, I'd be like okay, I walk away. <laughs> and, but if they would talk, I would, I would ask a million questions. I think that's so genius. So people keep that in mind, like whatever, you know, think about your competition or the company that's really selling products that are similar to yours and be ready to get yeah. out there and, and get out from your computer. Um, because we tend to want to do all of our research on the internet. Yeah. But, like, Oh, is there a new tool? Is there a new software? Yeah. Like, no, there's human beings out there. there are, like, there's, <laughs> yes. I think that's so genius, you know, because like I said, every, we're just sitting at our computer doing reach all, research all day, but getting up, going out there, going to those stores, hanging out in the aisles, talking to consumers without being like too weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to be creepy. Um, but it's, you know, it, and it's actually a lot of fun. I don't know. I, I'm, I think it's, I think it, like you said, it gets us out of the house. Like that's yeah. one of the biggest things working with entrepreneurs. Like if you're listening to this, if you're an entrepreneur and you just sometimes feel like, like, ah, man, like kind of a little bit alone, like it's normal. We all feel yeah. that way. And that's why little games, like little things like this is, you know, it's a reason to get out of the yeah. house. You know, a lot of times I start my day going to a coffee shop. I have the same place that I go to and I'll just sit there at the counter and, and I, I'm interacting with the barista because I'm, you know, I've been there. And as people come up, I'll just, you know, be like, oh, yeah. where'd you get that? Like, oh, that's a cool button on your, on your jacket or whatever. <laughs> you know, I'll just start conversations. It's, it's good to start your day that way. 
It really is. And, and I think doing that kind of thing helps stimulate your creativity in the long run. Yep. You know, being so just in, into the screen, right. Or on your phone, posting on Instagram or Facebook, it's not the same as having that human interaction. I think that's so, so key. So I'm glad that you brought that up, but and- And it's a great point because it's one thing we try to do in our communities, our online community. So if you're building a brand, um, I have a friend, Ray, who said like, once you have the audience, it's like cheating. Um, (laughs) Like if you can build that audience, you know, those guys or the gals who are using this and what, and you know, their home remodeling crew, like they just love DIY projects, whatever it is. And you could create that sense of a community, like in an online community. It's, it's amazing. So um, yeah, keep that in mind or that underground that you're talking about. That's so, so key. So Brian, one thing I want to talk with you about, and I'm going to be respectful of your time, um, but if you have some time to tell me a little bit about, talk a little bit about um, a few tips for a couple of really big dates that e-commerce sellers have coming up. Yeah. Um, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure on Cyber Monday, you're doing something with your dogs, right? Isn't that the day that you all, you said that you um, take them to get them groomed or something like that. I was listening to one of your other podcasts. I thought that was- <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it's a ritual. I mean, I just take them to get them groomed when, when, when I get tired looking. of picking up hair. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. Um, I think that might be the time of year where, yeah, that like maybe that winter coat comes in. The winter um, coat starts coming in. That's when you really start noticing like, yeah, hey, it's I, everywhere. I've got to handle this dog situation. I just had the guys, I have the guys come and clean the, uh, clean my car. We just went on a little road trip. So I had the dogs in the back. It's a, it's an, it's a, like a little, one of those old, uh, crossover, like minivans yeah. or not minivans, uh, SUVs. And, uh, and the back is just full of hair. It is horrible. So oh. the guy's like, oh my gosh. So that, that's usually also the sign, like, yeah, I got to take these dogs to, <laughs> to go get yes. groomed. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So some tips for Cyber Monday, Black Friday. All right. Ugh, I got so many. Okay. So let me, let me just, <laughs> let's boil it down to the essential. Um, the vital few. This is a huge thing that I talk about. If you ever listen to the podcast, um, if you ever, you know, if you're ever part of our communities, like I talk about vital few all the time. There's a lot of things we can do. There's only a few things that we need to be doing. Um, And the difference between successful people and very successful people is very successful people saying no to almost everything. Mm -hmm. And it's just focusing on the things that will actually move the needle. So are there a million things you can do to promote for Black Friday and Cyber Monday? Yes. Should you do them all? No. There's only a few things that if you, you know, because we all have limited time and resources. So one of the things that has worked extremely well for us I actually, it's one of the things that everyone in our intensive does because I give them the funnel, I give them the, the copy and everything. And this is something you can do very easily on your own is a first access list. Mm. Now it sounds really simple and I have people all the time who will see it and they're like, wait, so what we're doing is we're, we're, having, we're giving people the option to opt in to be the first ones to know about a sale and people actually opt in. Like not only do they opt in, we, it's some of our highest open rates when we send right. that email out. We'll get right, like 40, right. 50% open rates on those emails mm. and like 30, 40% click through rates. Like it's really high. Um, and people are like, that makes no sense. Like, I, I don't get it. Like they could just, okay, it's Black Friday. Like go shop. Like they, they know it's there. <laughs> They're like giving you, per, it's the ultimate permission marketing. So if you've ever read Seth Godin's work between permission and uh, interruption marketing, you know, Facebook is interruption marketing, right? Like, hey, here's my thing, buy it. Permission marketing is someone giving you an email, someone giving you a phone number, an address saying, yes, you can market to me. So it's the ultimate form of permission marketing. A few other things happen. We know from research that dopamine gets released when people anticipate a reward. So it literally is exciting. It chemically in their body, they are excited that they, this thing is going to happen and they're going to have a chance to be a part of it. So (laughs) first access lists are incredible. Um, And if you can also create a special offer, like because you're on the first access list, you're also getting this thing, Mm. whether it's a discount, you know, I prefer to bundle and, and uh, create offers with digital products. So that way it doesn't cut into my margin. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause if I have, you know, 
three mugs for a discount, it's like I'm losing on cost of goods. I'm plus I'm discounting. So, you know, if it's, if it's the mug and the beans, well, now it's some info product on how to like make the perfect cup of coffee or whatever, right? Right. right. That is only available to people who take advantage of the first access. Um, and you want to start that, you know, a week before we actually have Black Friday. So you give people a chance to actually opt in, get excited. And you want to send them a few reminder emails like, oh, we're counting down only four more days, only three more days, only two more days, only one more day. Like it's almost here. Um, that's been one of the most effective things that we've done. Now, we are in September and Black Friday is, you know, what is it? You know, two months away? Well, yeah, it's um, Black Friday in 2019 is going to be on November 29th. So I feel like it's a little later than, maybe like a little bit later than normal. Yeah. So, I mean, we're a little bit over two months away. So this is, and the reason I'm pointing that out is like, we want to start today. Like when you're listening, if you're listening to this now, like today's the day to start. And you start by maybe not necessarily doing your first access list. It's a little early for that, but you start by creating attention. You start by building your audience. I talk about a lot on my podcast and in our programs, I talk about the difference between traffic and audiences. Mm -hmm. Driving traffic is like screaming to random strangers walking down the street. Like, Hey, do you want to buy my stuff? (laughs) That's like, that's like, okay, you got attention. You got a lot of traffic, but they're not interested An audience. If you think of an audience, you know, if you've been to a concert, you're like applauding, you're, you're focused attention on the stage. Yep. You want those people. And I would, I would take a hundred people in an audience versus a hundred thousand on the side of a street mm-hmm. because those people are interested. They're actually paying attention to what I'm saying. Um, so start building the audience now so that when we're three weeks out from, from your, from black Friday and you're going to do your first access, You've got people who are like, sweet, Susie or, you know, John or whoever, they're they're doing this thing. I want to be a part of it. That's awesome. So as part of your mastermind, the intensive or e-com underground, you all really dig into getting people ready for Cyber Monday and Black Friday. Do you all really kind of dig into that? So, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to be clear like we don't dig into it like spend a lot of time around it i've done it so like last year i went through the full promotion for for a brand mm-hmm. so what i do is this is kind of how it works this is how the content gets updated there's a basic framework for the content but as we see things that are working you know because we still run we still have a few legacy accounts where we actually still run these you know multi-million dollar like accounts so we get to see a lot of things that are working plus I'm seeing what's working inside of our community. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll go ahead and take over and, and run, some, run some tests for people in the community just to get results. Like, that's the thing. If we find something that's working, then we modularize it and put it into the program. So for example, this first access list is something that it wasn't just an idea. We actually tested it in four or five different brands. We saw that it worked. Then we created formal content around it. I gave the share funnel, things like that. And then gave guidelines around, Hey, this is what worked. Um, so now people can follow that for black Friday, but you know, you should be running a promotion every month, right? We know that there's always a reason to run a promotion. Black Friday is a special one. Um, but as we come up with things that maybe are exceptional that are very different or have some nuance to it, we will, uh, test it, modularize it and put it into the program. So that's how we update the content. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So what are, what's one of the biggest mistakes you see e-commerce sellers making? And I like to talk a little bit about mistakes because, and I do the same thing with trademarks, trademark mistakes, because I feel like there's so much that we can learn from other people's mistakes. So what, what's one of the biggest mistakes that you see? Susie, I, I love that. I love that you even bring this up, right? Because again, this goes, this goes against, you know, if we want to accomplish something, right? We always are like, what do I have to do to accomplish it? Well, <laughs> one of the avoid? best things you can, <laughs> one of the best things you can do is invert the question. Um, you know, invert, always invert. I have a mug that I, I had made. It says invert, always invert. <laughs> so sometimes some of the, some of the big, biggest wisdom and some of the biggest insight is going to come from inverting the question. What do I have to make sure not to do? 
if I want to get this thing done, right? Like, how can I ensure failure, basically? Which is like, oh my gosh, don't say that. Okay, but let's be aware of what are the pitfalls so we avoid those things. Um, there's a great book, and I talked about it on my, on my podcast because it was like, I got to tell everyone about this. There's a billion books out there, maybe not a billion, but probably close to a million on 10 steps for success, seven things to do to succeed, three things every millionaire does that you should do, <laughs> blah, 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 right? One of the best books I've read on business is What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars. It's the name of the book by Jim Paul. It's amazing. It's what not to do. <laughs> what not to do, exactly. What I Learned Losing a Million Dollars. And it's basically the premise of the book is there's a lot of ways to make money. There's only a handful of ways to lose it. Mm. So avoid those things. So anyway, um, the biggest mistakes, the things I see, one hands down is not having a very, very strong hold and control and awareness of your numbers in the business. Mm -hmm. That is like hands down number one. Um, and I would say that tied with what you do, which is ensuring survival, mm -hmm. which is, you know, simple things, you know, do you, uh, you know, are legally are like the right structures in place? Do you have the right insurances? You know, if you focus on growth, but don't focus on survival, like think about that. Like your, your, your perspectives are a little off, right? Or you're like, your priorities are off because you know, I know I went through this for a long time. It's like, I didn't get the memo. Like you can't grow if you're not alive, right? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so it's not sexy, but it's the thing that's going to avoid like catastrophic loss, right? Right, so, right. So ensuring survival, making sure like business licenses or insurances and, um, you know, all those things are in place and uh, you're, you're the numbers. Because again, if, you're, if your numbers are off, you can feel like you're running a great business. Top line looks really sexy. But if, if, the, if, the, if you're at a, a burn rate that you can't support, you're not making money, like you're not going to survive. Again, not sexy things, but these are the things that allow you to survive. And the numbers, it's what it's going to allow you to actually scale. So those would be the two biggest mistakes that I see really any business owner make. I made them for a long time and I'm always still trying to stay aware and up to date, right? right. Um, yeah, I think that we get, a lot of people really get hung up on that revenue number, but as our businesses grow, our revenue increases, but are we really taking home as much at the end of the day? Our expenses increase too. Yep. So I think a lot of people, you know, they look at those, just those top line numbers, maybe if they're even looking at that. So. And, and if you've ever watched Shark Tank, I mean, I love that show. And what is the first thing you do? What's your cost to acquire a customer? Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's your, you know, what, right, what's, your, what's your profit margin? Um, you know, whatever, and whatever metrics are specific to them. And as soon as a business owner's like, um, uh, uh, all right, I'm out, like done, <laughs> like, no thanks. Cause they you know, know how important it is. Yeah. It's so important. I think those are some, some great tools or tips. And, and I, I'm going to probably wrap us up here, Brian, but a few of the takeaways that I'm really thinking about, and I want people to, to take away as well would be number one, doing, doing, being, being willing to do your research out, outside of your home <laughs> without sitting in front of a computer, like actually getting out there, talking to customers, going to stores that maybe sell your products. I think that's such a huge um, takeaway that a lot of people aren't doing. Yep. And of course, I think it's really important to look at those numbers. I'm one of those people that I'm not a numbers person and I'm very guilty. And, and just like, on that, Susie, is like, if you're not that person, like find that person. Find the person. That's the thing. That's how important it is. Yes. Like you have to have that one person, even if they're part-time, but their job is just to, just to pull stats and just give you a dashboard. Most business people, most entrepreneurs are visionaries. They're not, they're not number crunchers. Right. So you need to find that person so that you can just see a dashboard and you know where things stand. You know, that's how CEOs run their business. They're yes. not, they're not running spreadsheets, you know, right. They find somebody who's good with the numbers and then they wake up and they look at the dashboard, they look at the summary and they know where the business is going. Yeah. I love that. And I think that's really important for our entrepreneurs to be willing to take a step back and to relinquish some control to it doesn't necessarily have to be control, but relinquish <laughs> some of that to people who are experts in it and really understand 
where your assets are within your business, whether it's e-commerce, your e-commerce business or, or whatever, um, to be willing to let other people look at it and give you an analysis. I think that's, I think yeah. that's- And to give people, cause I know, I, I already know what people are thinking like, well, how do I do that? Right? Like, who do I hire? What is it? What are the numbers I need? There's two things you want to focus on. And I, there's actually, before we wrap up, there's one other thing I really want to talk about because yes. it's so much bigger than e-commerce and it's been on my heart lately. And I just, I want to talk about it briefly. Let's talk um, about it. But <laughs> these, this is where you want to start. You want to find a CPA that understands e-commerce. Mm, that's number that's one, because awesome. they're going to give you yeah. income statements, profit loss statements, balance sheets, and you're going to be able to start seeing what your profitability actually is. You're going to be able to start seeing how you're allocating expenses. It's very easy. They'll use a program like Xero, X-E-R-O. They'll mm -hmm. tie in all your expenses and you'll get a nice summary of everything. So you want a good CPA and then you want somebody in-house who can just build a basic spreadsheet for you and pull in numbers, pull in your advertising numbers, pull in your revenue numbers, just so you can see stats on your marketing efforts. So if you have stats on your marketing efforts, if you're doing Facebook ads and stuff, that's amazing because now you can get, you know, cost per acquisition, your average order value. You can, you can look at click-through rates, CPA, CPMs, all this stuff. Um, but that's their job. Their job is to pull all these numbers and then you've got an income, you know, you've got your, you know, profit and loss statement and then you've got your, uh, your advertising metrics and you can kind of see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like your marketing efforts. If you can just have that, you're already ahead of, you know, pretty much everybody. <laughs> I love that. And I, I'm sure most people aren't really digging into that and looking at their numbers. So that definitely for people who are willing to get a CPA who has experience and, in e-commerce. And actually I've got an amazing, amazing guy. So I, I mean, I'll make this available. If any, if you're listening to this and you'd like an introduction, um, I can introduce them to, to the guy that we use and the guy I recommend, so they can just actually, if they want to email us at support at ecomunderground.com, just let, it, let me know that you heard me talk about this on Susie's podcast, and I'd be happy to make an introduction for you. That's awesome, because sometimes it's really hard to get access to people like that. No, and <laughs> this guy you're willing to share your... <laughs> your no, he's version. amazing. Yeah. He's, and he actually, this is all he specializes in is e-commerce. I'm uh, sure he has a pretty good, big team at this point, too. So, yeah, but yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome. And what we'll do is I'll put your, um, I'll put that... Well, we'll talk about that, about whether or not- I'll yeah, we'll figure it I, out. I just, I just I thought of it. I was like, like, you know what? Because I'm trying to think like, what are the questions <laughs> that your listener is having right now? They're like, well, how do I find a good CPA? So yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah. I'll introduce you. So anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think that's such, such a good idea is having a CPA who's experienced in your industry and trying to find one has got to become challenging because- e-commerce in its current form has not really been around that long. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and the laws are changing so quickly. The laws are changing so quickly. And, but the problem, and I'll talk about the law here <laughs> really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. This is your, this is your domain. <laughs> the problem, I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> yeah, no, but one thing I, I love that you, you know, you talked about a few things that people need to do to ensure survival. And that's something that I help my clients with, but um, you know, r at the end of the day, technology just changes so much faster than the law and it's trying to keep up. Right. Like, but there are so many issues out there. Like the, the legal field is based on precedent, right? So cases are decided based on what has been held before. And by that very nature, it's, it just is that particular industry that is a bit slower to change than others. So in some ways it does have a hard time keeping up with the pace of other industries like, like e-commerce, you know, 20 years ago, I think I was trying to sell a couple of law books on Amazon. <laughs> um, but was it 20 years? No, it wasn't that long ago. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to age myself that much. <laughs> two years ago, two years ago, <laughs> two years ago, <laughs> not 20, <laughs> not even close. Um, so, you know, I think about that. I remember, you know, kind of playing around with the Amazon platform and gosh, you know, that was probably like the early 2000s. Yeah. It was that, um, like wild west time. Yeah, Actually, it was, that was even before then when they were, they were, they were becoming Amazon. They were becoming Amazon. Yeah. yeah. And I remember one thing I loved about Amazon way back then, probably around 2005, was that, you know, I could order a book online and 
I was, I was living in Louisville, Kentucky at the time. And I guess there was a distribution center really close. And I could like have that thing at my, you know, at my house, like the next day almost, you know? Yeah. And so it was the technology even then was pretty, was pretty impressive, you know? And now yeah. I live out in the middle of nowhere. I'm probably, I don't know how close I am to the nearest distribution center, but you know, it's uh Everything, everything out here is like one day they're building, they're building one like down the street, <laughs> like right, right around here. Yeah. So like all my deliveries, I don't think, and it's not built yet, but for some reason, it must be something nearby because my delivery, I usually don't have to wait more than, there's a lot of stuff that I can get in a day, like the same day. day. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, pretty amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so as much yeah. as we knock Amazon. And I'm guilty of it. I, I do, I do use Amazon, you know, I'm a, oh, yeah, I'm it's a, amazing. I'm a consumer on there. It's and amazing. But you know, I buy, I buy all my, like, I buy books on Amazon. So everything I buy books, um, cause it's just easy yeah. and very much like, uh, just, you know, um, commodities, like things that I just, I don't care, you know, like, you know, Pencils. A, uh, yeah, exactly people. stuff i don't care about but like supplements yeah. never ever ever <laughs> ever ever i just know too much yeah there's n i will never buy a supplement on amazon and if you're my friend you've heard why and you don't buy supplements on amazon now right. like right so anything that i really care about um i i don't i just don't buy on there honestly so especially yeah. anything in, in anyway i don't anything i want to go down this road oh yeah so, yeah yeah, but Let me wrap up. <laughs> I want to talk about this because it's yeah. something that, you know, um, and you, you actually mentioned, you're like, how do you define success? And it, uh, it, it, something I've been talking about so much lately because I'm at this point in my life and, and I've, I've been up and I've been down and I've had highs and lows and fallen and failed. And like, I think I'm getting, I'm approaching that age now where, you know, I'm more introspective than I used to be. And there's like, I finally, I'm like, dang, I like know a few things that I want to pass on to people and Isn't like the next generation, you Isn't know, it's weird, when, it weird yeah. when it starts happening. You know, I'm, um, yeah, I play golf with these younger guys <laughs> and you know, they're in their mid twenties. Um, Youngsters. and <laughs> I wonder what they think about me. Cause sometimes I tell them like, you guys must think like, okay, we're playing golf with Brian again. He's going to have, you know, life lessons from Brian. And then they told me, they're like, no, we actually like it, man. Cause you tell us these things. Yeah. So here's the biggest thing that I have. This is the point I'm at. And I wish someone would have told me this early on. So if you're still listening to this, first of all, I hope that this has been insightful for you and you've gotten some benefit from it. Um, but this is probably the biggest thing. And it goes back to this idea of, of figuring out the foundation before we build stuff. Mm -hmm. So the same way that with this brand building, before you start running ads and stuff, you got to build the foundation. Who are you selling to, right? When it comes to life and success, and I've had, oh man, like the last four years of my life have been super difficult. Like um, the business has done well on the outside. Everything looks great. Lots of success. Things are doing, you know, things are moving and I've been very blessed. There's been a lot of obstacles, you know, um, and I won't get into all of them because it doesn't matter, but because everyone has their own, their own thing. But the biggest thing is when you're figuring out success, I promise you it has nothing to do with money. And I know people say that, but I, I, it's like, as you get more money, your problems just get bigger. That's it. So the biggest thing is, and this is what I wish I would have known. And, 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 you know, hopefully someone, someone's listening to this because listen up this youngsters, would, this would have helped me a lot. <laughs> is I define success and where I'm at in my life, this is what I'm doing right now, this is what I'm engineering, is figuring out first, what is the life that I want? Mm -hmm. And then realizing that there is, this is the best time ever to be alive, to create the life that you want. We have so many yeah. resources available. And instead of chasing someone else's vision of success, someone else's dream, someone else's dollar number, someone else's employee size number, someone else's exit number, whatever it is, figure out what that is for you. And the way you do that is you, you, re, you reverse engineer it based on the life you want. And then you have to become the person who can have that life. And you have to create the, create the, you know, the resources and create the business. Cause I think business is the best way to build the life you want. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you have the risk tolerance to be an entrepreneur, that's like a huge prerequisite. But if you know, I want to be an entrepreneur, then you know, what's the right number? Like, is it, is it a million a year? 
Is it a hundred thousand a year? Is it 10 million a year? I don't know. Like you've got to decide it for yourself. You know, so many times and I've been a part of a lot of masterminds, like high, high level masterminds where I see people that you would look at, you're like, Oh my gosh, they're so successful. And you know, a lot of times, yes, they are. They've got an amazing life, but a lot of times they're also chasing someone else's dream. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you just, you just take time, some time to introspect and just, you know, what is it that I want? What's the kind of life I want to live? Like, what is, what do I want a Monday to look like for me? What do I want my vacations to look like? What do I want my family to look like? And then back into that with a business and figure out, okay. And that's what, if you've read the work rework, read the book rework, that was the first book that opened my eyes to this, that more isn't always the goal. Right. Um, those guys are the ones who founded a company. Uh, right now it's, it's called 37 Signals, or it used to be called 37 Signals. Now it's uh, Basecamp. Oh, yeah. And he has no interest in, DHH and Jason Freed have no interest in growing their company. They have none. They're like, it'll just grow. We're happy with what we've built. And everyone is so focused on more and more and more. Like if you're not, if you're, and there's a, um, there's an intervention bias. Like people, there's a, people think that, they have to do something. A lot of times the best course of action is no action, like not doing anything. <laughs> so the, the whole point of this is if you figure out what's the life you want, you live in an amazing time. And, I, and I, I'm saying this for myself, like I have to remind myself, this is an amazing time to be doing this and I get to build a life um, and I get to build a business that supports that life. So that, that would be the biggest thing that I would um, like to finish with and share. No, I absolutely love that. And I think that you make a really important point that we live in an amazing time and we do take it for granted. I'm guilty. Me too. Me too. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that we have to just take a moment to, to be grateful for, for being, I mean, no, nothing is perfect, right? But we're living in pretty good economic times. <laughs> yeah. You know, and we live in a pretty good country. You know, I'm like, people are gonna like send me hate mail, you know, <laughs> either way. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm unapologetic about that. I really am. Like we, we're, uh, we, we won the genetic lottery. If, and the fact, I mean, if there's, it is what it is. So I, I, and a lot of it's perspective. So, I mean, the point is there's, whether it's good or bad, it's one of the best times. Comparatively, there hasn't been a time in the last hundred years where we could build, we have so many resources available to us where we can build a really good life. And that's, I think that's the main thing I'm talking about. Um, whether it's good or bad now, like, I don't know, you can have your opinion. Right. But, right. you know, I'll take, I'll take average today versus, you know, better than average 500 years ago is what I'm saying. Like we have so many opportunities, <laughs> so many resources available. So in any case, I love that. I love that. <laughs> Brian, this has been such a fantastic conversation. I've, I've loved having you on here. I feel like you're just a wealth of information, not only from the e-commerce space and the marketing space, but just as an entrepreneur, I just, when are you going to write a book? <laughs> I know you uh, like to read. <laughs> I like to read them. I don't like you to write them. Can, can <laughs> I'll just keep doing podcasts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Oh, maybe you can like turn your podcast into a book one day. So yeah. Yeah. But That's yeah. Funny. So um, Brian's podcast is awesome. It, and one thing I love about Brian's podcast is it's not like every episode is not like super long. <laughs> I keep them short. I keep them short. I know. No, uh, I, think, I think that's great though. I mean, I go a little long on some of mine, but I just, I feel like there's such great content in a condensed amount of space. You do a really good job with that. Thanks. And if you're in, if you know, if you're in this space, I think it's that your podcast is a must as far as I'm concerned to have on your, your list of podcasts to listen to. Thanks. So it's yeah, just I try to, feedback. I try to keep it. You can, you can listen to it on the way to work real quick. Uh, yeah. On a quick walk, walk the dog. You could, you know, they usually keep about 10 minutes and uh, try to try to give you what you need. So Good yeah. Stuff. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Let me ask you, where can people find you? Yeah. So if they go to, um, if you're want to learn more, you can go to ecomunderground.com. That's E-C-O-M. I think if you type in two M's, it still goes there anyway. We, we thought of that, but um, it is Ecom Underground with one M. Uh, you can get the podcast there. The podcast is called Marketing for E-Commerce. So pretty straightforward. 
Um, yeah, that's a good place to start. We have a free Facebook group, um, but I would recommend start listening to the podcast, uh, yep. you know, and that's a great place to start. Awesome. Some of the books that we talked about, I will link to them um, in the show notes because I think Sweet. that's really important, especially the one that, um, that you had mentioned about the, I think he self-published it. I can't remember his name, but he, what I, what I learned losing a million dollars, what I learned a losing a million dollars. Yeah. It's a great right. story. It, yeah. It'll keep, it's not like blah, 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 like business, business, yeah. business. It's a great story. Yeah. So. He had to self-publish that one, right? <laughs> yeah. Cause nobody's going to publish that. Like, yeah. No, everyone's like, uh, no, it has to be. No, no, that's eight. negative. Yeah. <laughs> and actually there's, there's a book I'm about to read. I haven't read it yet, but I heard about it from uh, another book that I read, it's called Rethinking Positive Thinking. And this is pretty interesting. I'll leave you with this. Studies show that people who think about failure are actually more likely to succeed. Not because they're thinking about failure and like worried, but they're seeing, it goes back to the inversion question. They're seeing the possible pitfalls instead of putting on rosy colored glasses and thinking everything's going to go great. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, yeah, so that, that's interesting. And I want to read that, but I, I myself am a little bit of a pessimist and <laughs> no, Susie, no, I, yeah, I know. But as an attorney, that's what you do. Like you're always seeing your head. Like what is this pitfall that this yeah, person could, yeah. could face? Like you're always thinking about that or, you know, what, how's this person going to respond to this or what happens if this, or, you know, so I, I tend to approach things from that perspective. <laughs> um, Heavy Downer? And, yeah. Remember, do you remember that from Saturday Night Live? Do you remember that? Which, who is it? Debbie Downer, that character. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go out for a nice drive. Did you know that car fumes are like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and I don't like being a Debbie Downer. I usually try to be very positive. Um, but, you know... My my job is I have to to let people know. Yeah, you gotta see you gotta see all the like all the pitfalls so you can protect them. So you're so protecting can, yeah. people like that's anyway. That's my job. People pay me to, and you're really good at it too. Incur their yeah. well, I don't know, but thank you so much. They pay me to incur their that that negativity a little bit. You well, know? I so. I know you're really good because you've actually helped some of my clients and students, and they rave about you. So oh, that's I good. I know you're thank amazing you. at what you do firsthand from, from people you've helped. So I appreciate that so much. So, well, Brian, thank you again for being on here. I so, so appreciate it. And with that said, I guess we'll say goodbye. And as I always say, never stop learning. Thanks, never stop. Brian. All right. See you, Susie. Bye.